Welcome to the Right Time Podcast. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. You can send us a tweet at the 1-800-Flowers.com Twitter feed. That is at Bomani underscore Jones. Game five tonight, Wizards. Celtics, hey man, I, I'm looking forward to this game. We got a good one last night, and I've just found this series itself to be generally entertaining. I think the Wizards are a fun team to watch, and the Celtics, I mean, you watch them and you're like, I don't understand how they keep winning games, but they sure do, right? Not so many good players. They're one good player. It's not very large, but here we are, and here's Isaiah Thomas. we got a quote for you. He says, I'm treating it as a must win. I'm treating it as the biggest game that I've ever played. Hopefully, everybody else is treating it like that. But I thought this was just pivotal, Shaq. How do we go from pivotal to must win? Like, it's both now, huh? Yeah, like, did nobody tell him? Like, he's skipping steps right now. Like, this isn't quite a must win. Y'all at home, I don't feel like this is the must win for y'all. This is simply pivotal for Boston. But, no, he is taking this straight to the must win part of it. And I, though I will say, the way they got smoked those two games in Washington, they can't feel like they can just come back and win those. He went straight from he, – he bypassed hyperspeed and went right to Plaid. But, he, look, he knows this team better than we do. And he knows especially how well Washington played back in, in game six, how, the, how Wizards played in Washington, that if they lose this one, it might be over for them in that stave situation for game six. Yeah, and it's going to be cracking in there too. Like that's one thing about it. Like there, I mean, there aren't that many arenas where I feel like me watching the game is improved by the fact that a game is at a certain arena. Um, Oakland, I guess, is one of those – more before than now, right? Like, now it still kind of goes, but, like, what that arena was, like the 07 one, oh, boy, like, that's a different ball game. But Boston is one of those. Like, I don't know what it is. Madison Square Garden is another one where, I, well, I mean, okay, there haven't been that many games lately at Madison Square Garden that allow you to feel that way. But Madison Square Garden is, like, a half step away from playing at the Rucker, right? It's like the Rucker with nicer seats. I don't know. There's just something about it that makes it feel like everything is closer and smaller and more intimate. The Boston Garden feels that same way, and they get loud. Loud in there, Jack. Loud in there. Especially when they start playing at ACDC. That's one thing about uh, the Garden. The Garden's like, we don't have an NBA and an NHL playlist. We just got one CD. One CD. Got the same mixtape. They got the same tape. They just flip it over to side Every, Everybody else got different tapes. Not in Boston. They're like, no, sir, Rebob. Those guys get paid plenty of money. They can listen to our heavy metal. They got no problem with that. What are my favorite moments at that garden? You remember that time when uh, Rasheed Wallace was playing for the Pistons? I don't know if you saw this. It was one game late. Late, like last minute of the game, and everybody's all, you know, coming out of the huddle, getting ready to go for it, and they were playing Paradise City over the PA, and somehow the camera caught Sheed, and all they catch is Sheed going, take me home. <laughs> it's like it was his jam. He was ready for it, bro. He was ready for it. So, yeah, I, I am looking forward to this one. And, okay, so how much of this is going to be the Wizards aren't good at home? I mean, aren't good on the road, and then it kind of flips up when they go there, right? How much of it is one thing? It's not. I don't think exposed is the right way to put it, but there's a certain bottom line element to this, which is the Celtics just don't have that many good players, right? So how much of this change is because you're at home? One, you would expect that Boston gets more calls at home. Two, you would expect that Boston would get better play out of the role players, right? Like one thing Charles Barkley says that I'm pretty much always on board with is, Role players play better on the road, right? Like role players, I mean, at home rather. Role players play better with all that comfort. Stars are pretty impervious to those sorts of things. But role players, those things really matter. The margins wind up being thinner for those guys, right? So will you get more out of that? Because Boston is nothing but a team of role players. They are, after all, a handful of low spades, right? So maybe you got to be in your own chair, have your own table set up. Y'all got your own ashtray sitting there at the table for you to feel right making those plays that you need to make. Maybe that's it. I don't know. But, man, Isaiah Thomas, if he's on the, this is the most important game I've ever played in my life, like, I feel why you say that. But, oh, buddy, you might want to calm down just a little bit, man. You got more games to play after this one. Might want to chill out. Might want to ease up. Just a wee bit. Except you can't, because when you got Isaiah Thomas, every game is the most important game you've ever played, because you 5-9. That's all it is. You 5-9. There's no other option. So I'd imagine that the pressure is on Boston tonight. All the pressure's on Boston. Who? Kind of? Like, who's the pressure not on? I think Boston, I mean, I guess you would say that and for no other reason than 
if you're Washington, you got to be feeling good, right? Because the thing about them is they have to feel like we've played two bad quarters. Like, more or less in this postseason, they have played played two bad quarters. And since they played that in that way, they got to feel like we are the better team. I certainly feel like they are the most talented team, like one through seven. I think it's fair to say that they are the most talented team, and they've been punishing Isaiah Thomas on defense. And that's what I'm wondering. Can they keep that up? Because we watched the the Bulls when they played against the Celtics, and we're like, well, why aren't you just making Isaiah Thomas play more defense? And I'm guessing that's very simple and easy for me to say where I am, but it's just like, oh, why aren't you playing more defense, right? I mean, making Isaiah Thomas play more defense. The Wizards made him play a lot of defense in Washington, a lot. They're running them through screens. And the Wizards have three perimeter players who are legitimate offensive threats. Like Otto Porter isn't great, but he's a threat, right? Or at the very least, Isaiah Thomas can't guard him. Right? So they ain't but so much switching, they ain't but so much hiding that you can do with Isaiah Thomas. You can't put him on Morris. Morris will back him down. You can put him on Gortat. Gortat will back him down. There's no place for them to hide him. And they're running him through, wearing him down, right? Like that's what that that's the chance that the Wizards have. So they're going to be more calls when Isaiah Thomas has the ball, but they're not going to be making calls on those screens. Like you got to make this as difficult for him as absolutely possible. By the way, let us not forget Isaiah Thomas. He's already started begging the refs. And they were allowing them to be very physical with me, coming off ball screens, coming off pin downs. And all I'm saying is I felt like when I tried to be physical with them on the other end, there were fouls. And when guys went to the hole and maybe got hit a little bit on layups, they were fouls. And then when we went to the hole, especially myself, I'm hitting the ground and there's no calls. The call should definitely be a little more even as to in the season where I might have been top five in free throws. John Wall, like, what you mean? Next I haven't been getting calls neither. This is the first game I got called. Last game was not free throws. So I've been getting grabbed and beat up the whole series too. So it's so a part of the game. The playoffs are a lot more physical. And it's, it's two teams competing. It's trying to win the series. And we know it's at stake. So if we bring that physical approach to the game, I think we like our chances of playing because we can't just let those guys move wherever they want and let him get wherever he wants. You know, something you have to play through. I wish they would have put a microphone in front of the homie Gortat. Gortat would have been like, man, I've been trying to get more foul calls myself for the last seven years. I don't have this jump man tattoo for nothing. Right. Well, one, you know, one thing I did wonder, though, about Isaiah Thomas and him, you know, saying that he didn't understand why he wasn't getting more calls. Why was he doing that and not Brad Stevens? All right, because that's that's normally the coach who does the campaigning with the officials. I mean, is that something Brad Stevens is above? And I'm I'm not being sarcastic when I ask that. It's a serious question. Like, I mean, I would look to the coach as being the guy who would do that. And look, Stevens guys all respect him to no end. Isaiah Thomas is a big Brad Stevens fan. If you check the Jackie McMullen feature on Brad Stevens and hear the ways that players talk about him, they rock with him. And Brad Sheila, Brad Stevens is not some shrinking violet, right? You don't see him when he's going hard on guys, but he does it, right? He just has that, you know, you get him, you, y'all got him on that Opie Taylor because he looks so young. But no, nah, Brad Stevens is that guy. Like at some point, I do think he's got to realize, yo, in the NBA, this is the coach's job. The coach's job is to come out here and campaign for those fouls for Isaiah Thomas. Or is Isaiah Thomas going to come out here and get a technical foul in order to make it happen? I don't know. But I was a bit surprised there. By the way, Isaiah Thomas was fined $25,000 for what he said to that fan when he told the fan that he would F him up, and he knew that. I feel like Isaiah Thomas would pay $25,000 every game gladly for the privilege of making sure that at least one fan knows I will F you up, and you know that. Charles Barkley said he wished they could beat the hell out of one fan every game. And I'm not saying I necessarily go that far. I will say, however, there is at least one fan close enough to the action who probably deserves to get the hell beat out of him at every single game. All right, 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number here on the right time. Coming up next, how offended would you be if people asked you if that was you in the picture with a nude shark? Well, you nude in the picture with a shark. Because the shark is always nude. Find out how mad Jim McElwain was about this on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app at SiriusXM Channel 80. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. Spencer Hall of SBNation.com joins us next segment. Spencer Hall joins us at 6.30 in Eastern to talk about how Atlanta finally got that highway opened up. 
Hey, do you want to go to every single NBA Finals game? If so, make sure that you're listening to Mike and Mike every day this week at 720 and 920 Eastern for your chance to win the Mike and Mike Dream Final Sweepstakes brought to you by Dell for Small Business. And that's the old soul song of the day, Cold Sweat by James Brown. I'm just trying to get this long enough till we can get to the part where he says, I break out. You know James Brown was 5'6", by the way. Yeah, I was always thrown off because of the heels. Explains everything, though. Here's the part. No, it's not. Okay, we turn it off. It's taking too long. 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. So did y'all see this picture of this dude that looked like Jim McElwain humping a shark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Jim McElwain is the head football coach at the University of Florida, and there's a picture of him. Well, it's not him. It's a dude that looks like him, and he's in a boat, and he's butt naked, and he's on top of a shark. Now, I've got questions, A, about how the shark got in the boat, and B, why you would be naked and want to get on the shark. And, like, the dude's got, like, the super tan line when he's on the shark, and he's smiling, and he's got these big old teeth, and he's got a haircut, kind of like Jim McElwain's. And his big old teeth are kind of like Jim McElwain's. So it became kind of funny to bounce around the Internet, people saying that it was Jim McElwain. Guess who doesn't think it's funny? That's right, Jim McElwain. You've become part of this big viral photo. Sure. I mean, what's your feeling on this situation? Well, first and foremost, I don't know who it is, but it isn't me. Clearly. <laughs> I mean, it's what, what's your just feeling in general? Just that something like this I, could even get out there and become a story? Well, I guess that's for you guys to answer. And, you know, in the world we live, what is a story? I just know this. It isn't me. He has no sense of humor. Just play that one more time so you can hear how little of a sense of humor Jim McElwain has at the idea that maybe he gets naked and hump sharks. You've become part of this big uh, viral photo. Sure. I mean, w- w- what's your feeling on this situation? Well, first and foremost, I don't know who it is, but it isn't me. Clearly. <laughs> I mean, it's, what, what's your just feeling in general? Just that something like this I, could even get out there and become a story. Well, I guess that's for you guys to answer. And, you know, in the world we live, what is a story? I just know this. It isn't me. So this is what I need to know about this. Who is it that Jim McElvain is trying to convince that it's not him? Right? Because, I mean, don't chuckle off like, oh, yeah, I heard about that story. Da, da, da. No, Jim McElvain is like, yo, it is not me. Who does he? Who thinks it's him? Who did he go to and had to be like, no, I, it's not. No, really, it's not me. I promise it's not me. Well, you better get on TV and tell everybody that it's not you because my friends think I married some shark humper. Is that what it is? Did he have to go to his bosses? And it's, look, look, if you if you on the Internet at some point today, look, you're going to find you'll see some pictures, right? But I'll tell you right now, it wasn't me. Well, like, I kind of understand to a degree, right? Like, one of my homeboys, he's probably listening to this, or if he ain't listening now, he'll probably listen later. But one of my homeboys he used to live in this house. This is when I was in graduate school at Carolina. Living in the house with a whole bunch of dudes, and they were still in undergrad, right? And the door didn't lock securely, so there was kind of no telling who could be in and out of there. Anyway, one night, shall we say, someone left a deposit in the bathtub. Right. A deposit in the bathtub. And I forget exactly how, but somehow I was the prime suspect. But I'm like, look, I can tell you right now, it wasn't me. Right? Like, I think I fell asleep on the couch over there that night or something like that. But I'm like, look, it wasn't me. And so for a while after that, my partner would always be talking and joking and be like, yeah, Bo left the deposit in the tub. I'm like, dog, but for real, I didn't do that. Right? And then he kept joking about it. I'm like, but for real, I didn't do that. Ten years later, literally ten years, ten years later, I realized something. Wait a minute. This dude isn't joking. He actually thinks that I did that, at which point I became furious, right? And I'm telling him, I'm like, dude, stop telling people I did that. But you, I'm like, no, I did. I've been telling you for 10 years that I did not do this. And I don't think it dawned on him until that moment. Wait a minute. He didn't actually do this. Maybe Jim McElwain is trying to nip this in the bud early, right? He ain't going to have nobody thinking he left a deposit in the tub. He's like, look, it wasn't me. Ain't no jokes. It was not me. That being said, would it have been cooler if it was him? I honestly don't know how you go into a recruit's house, though, and there's pictures of you floating around, naked pictures of you with a shark. I don't know how you can walk into a recruit's house and ask the parents to trust you with their kid. That, that is a good point. 
I, I do think that once you put it in that context, that yes. What if you tell him, I wrestled that shark out of the water myself. If your son gets out of line, I'll do the same thing to him. I'll wrestle him out the water, and then I'll lay naked on top of him. Nah, that wouldn't work. I don't think that's the recruiting um, approach that would get, nah, nah, not in the South. But I will say, though, to your point, he took it really seriously. I don't blame him for it, but he could have played it off, though. Right, because I'm sure there's some coaches out there, like like if a Dabble Sweeney or somebody would have would have at least had a little more fun with it, like a Jim Hart. Well, maybe not Jim Hart. Nick Saban. Well, maybe not. Well, actually, I don't really see too many college football <laughs> coaches that would have had fun with this. <laughs> Let me tell you something, though. Jim McElwain, they go fire him from that job sooner than wins and losses would indicate that they should, because he's no fun. Right, he's absolutely no fun. Like this job is going to burn him out if it hasn't burned him out already. Remember, this is the man who already said that uh, his job was to get to the SEC championship game. We're like, bro, this is Florida you work at. Ain't nobody selling for that. Eight 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 seven two nine three seven seven six. That's the telephone number here on the right time. We were talking about whether or not you'd actually want to attend a game seven for your own team because it comes with a lot of tension. Let's hit the phones and talk to Michael from Austin. Michael, thanks for calling the right time. Hey, how's it going, Bo? Doing all right. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to back you up on what an awful, awful, awful idea it is to go to a game <laughs> seven. I'm the worst experience I've ever had in my life going to a game was going to actually a game seven hockey game. I'm, now I'm even not that huge of a fan, but I was a big Phoenix Coyotes fan back in the day. Uh, and they were playing a game seven uh, against the Blues. And it was pretty much their best chance of winning ever. Uh, they were only the fourth seed that year, but that was back when it was, the Western Conference was stacked with, like, the Red Wings, the Stars, the Colorado. But so they had a four or five matchup, and it went all the way to the game seven. And all games were really tight, one goal games. And I was at the game. Uh, with my brother, good seats on the blue line in the, in the front of the upper deck, and it went all the way to overtime, zero zero. Like you know, mm. everyone was, there were so many close goals, but both the goalies were standing on their head. It was getting tense. Everyone was like shaking. Everyone was getting really weird, and it went all the way into the overtime. But it still, everyone thought we we're going to win. And then in that split second, you know, there was a freak goal. And the season's over. Every, you got to go home. Mm. And we were just sitting there shook. And we're like, and we couldn't move. And then, like, the people, the, like, the stands and people in the stands, they, they forced you to go. And we're like, for real? Come on. Can't we just sit here for a minute and stew? And we had to leave. And we were all pissed. And I was a teenager at the time. And this is a side note. Like, like, I was going out, and we were going out in front of Symphony Hall. And they had a bunch of velvet ropes there. And I just grabbed one. I just threw it across the courtyard of the Symphony <laughs> Hall. That's how, that's how pissed I was. And then I grabbed it and I took it home, and then I used it as a souvenir. Basically, whenever I, things were really tense in a game, I would just grab it, kind of bang it against the ground to try to get out that tension. Um, so, that, I don't know. I guess that's the only good thing that came from it. But it was an awful, awful night. Well, I tell you, thanks for the call. You guys heard it from Michael. Don't go watch your team in a game seven. You could wind up throwing stuff. 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number coming up next. They're going to get I-85 back open for Monday rush hour in Atlanta. Spencer Hall of SB Nation will tell us how they go mess this up on ESPN Radio, the ESPN app, Sirius XM, Channel 80. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. All guests join us on the Shell Penzoil Performance Line, just like our next guest. Check him out at SBNation.com. He's the best college football writer in America. His name is Spencer Hall. Now, Spencer, you are a University of Florida graduate. What did you think when it looked like your head coach was humping a shark, but he swears he was not? Oh, that's fine. That's fine. That's typical. I mean, you don't go to the University of Florida, which is located in Florida, without expecting important public figures to be seen cuddling wildlife. So that's fine. That's that's typical. That you signed up for that. I signed up for that. So yeah, and it's funnier still, by the way. He's he's kind of he he's kind of mad about it because if you ask him, he he's not cool about denying it. He's like, no, of course that's not me. And by the way, it's not him. It's clearly not him. Like, it's just, it kind of looks like him, but he, but I'm just going to say, keep, you know, like bringing this up and saying, yeah, it's definitely not him. Definitely not the guy 
who looks like he's naked straddling a shark because <laughs> because he's not cool about it, right? This is like if your friends catch you doing something and it turns out you're actually doing something else that wasn't either as embarrassing or you had a reason to do it, if you're cool about it, they'll let it go. And if you're not cool about it, they'll keep bringing it up. So so remind me, uh, I need to stop talking about that picture, which is definitely not Jim McElwain, uh, in flagrante delicto with the shark. I also feel like he doesn't get, man, Florida man. You are a man in Florida. Florida man could be you. We all have to not deny these things from time to time. You, I mean, you, you're just – that's part of the deal, right? Like, does he not know where he is? Does he not know that this is a state where – People have been arrested for riding manatees. I mean, manatees in the water, in their own territory, just chilling and relaxing. Nope. Apparently not aware that that's an actual thing, right? That people have been stung by stingrays because they went to try to take a ride on them. This is a thing. You need to know that you're part of a grand tradition. He's got things to learn, man, even in like year four. I went to college with a guy who swears up and down he once bounced off a manatee with a jet ski. This is back I believe when they it. were like, like almost extinct. Yeah, no, I, I believe it. You tell me a Florida wildlife encounter, I will believe it. Just like if somebody's from Montana and they're like, hey, you know, a grizzly bear took my SATs for me and I got like an 1100. I, I would still believe that as well. <laughs> We're talking to Spencer Hall of SB Nation on the right time. Now, uh, switching gears just a little bit. Ed, Ed Ogeron was on uh, Dan Levitard's radio show today. Ed Ogeron says when he drinks energy drinks, he drinks eight to ten energy drinks a day. How frightened are you at the prospect of Ed Ogeron hopped up on 10 energy drinks? Terrified, but I don't know at what point the additive energy drink makes you any matter or more Ed Ogeron, right? Like, where, where do you say he really kicks into high gear? Is it zero? Like, I don't know what the scariest number is because if you tell me Ed Ogeron at zero energy drinks, I might be a little worried because if he can have 10, he probably needs at least three to sort of really get up and raring. So. Uh, I think maybe six or seven, that's the threshold you want. Any number to me is frightening. It's all scary because Ed Ogeron uh, is is kind of terrifying. Well, also, where should we set the, set the number on how many he had when he met the Ole Miss football team for the first time and may or may not have ripped off his shirt and challenged them to fight? He rolled in that door with like 15 in the system, guaranteed. If the infamous Wild Boy story is correct or accurate at all, he's hanging like at least 15 over energy drink par. We were talking to Spencer Hall of SBNation.com. Now, here's why we had you on. We talked to you the day that the freeway caught on fire in Atlanta. Now we are hearing earlier than anyone expected that the freeway, I-85, will be ready for the Monday rush hour commute. Is Atlanta ready to have his freeway back? No, no. We shouldn't be trusted with them. We we really, I mean, like, if you give us more roads, we just demand more roads. The thing that people say about all government programs, well, if you give them this, they'll just want more. Yeah, they never say that about roads, and they really should. Because we're not ready. Also, can I just run this by you? Do, do you trust anything that, you know, the governor of Georgia says is ready after, like, a shockingly short amount of time in construction? I don't. <laughs> I just don't, regardless of the party. Governor of Georgia strolls through and says, folks, it's safe. Just turn that sentence around. That's, that's what I'd do. I'd just say, I'm going to wait. I'm going to give you a month or two before I decide to take the main route. Well, how have people been surviving this? I didn't bother to check back up after the first couple of days of awful traffic. Uh, yeah, people survived it by going around it, which didn't really work all that well. Typically, like a good 30 to 45 minute delay either way, depending on your side route. Um, they, they didn't survive the way that you're supposed to, right? People say, well, you know, you should take public transportation. Maybe take a bike. You should carpool a ride share. Nope. Just, just kept doing the same thing over and over again. Zero behavior change. Just well, longer commutes. Well, it's also a city full of people who would love to take public transportation and say, oh, damn it, we've worked our whole lives to stop public transportation from coming anywhere near our homes. Exactly. Also, people, like, just steadfast and stubborn in their habits like anyone else, right? Like, probably did the counterintuitive thing, right? Like, I'm going to be smarter than anyone else. They tell people to stay off the roads. I bet they're empty. Yeah, genius, they were. That's why you're, that's why you're completely late for dinner, and it's going to be 7.15 before you get home. We're talking to Spencer Hall of SBNation.com. I do have a general college football question for you. I'm curious your thought here. They have now brought in an early signing period in football like there is in basketball, and now in December recruits can sign. Is this a good idea? Because it kind of sounds like a bad idea. I think it's a bad idea. Just to me, if you get the more windows you have to sign, 
then the more moments of stress you build into everyone's lives, that's like coaches and recruits combined. I, I think that it should just be, it should just be open, man. You sign, you sign. I'm fine with it. Like we have too many rules around recruiting anyway. I'm, I'm kind of a recruiting libertarian. You should just let people sign when they want to sign and then be done with it. Right. And then you're locked in. That's, that would be fine with me. I, I think creating these kind of artificial windows just, makes things harder right and if i'm not mistaken this one's right before the holidays right yes yeah so that's that's great right take a time when you need to be both present at your job because of a bowl game and for recruiting double the pressure on recruiting and just say goodbye to any personal or family time you might have built in there it's a great idea the NCAA club so glad you're doing well that's what i was thinking about this also it's like the idea that we're coming into that time of year and if these college football coaches aren't stressed enough now you got to go seal the deal yeah, you got to go seal the deal. You got to build like an additional moment where some like you're also talking, you know, 17, 18, 19 year olds who are going through this process. Right. And you give them multiple opportunities to make a decision. I guarantee you there's just going to be multiple opportunities to sort of either a mess it up or b drag it out and, and take it like it took me a really long time when I was 18 to decide, you know, what low budge fast food restaurant I was going to eat at. And there were only like five choices. Right. If you doubled those choices, it'd take me like an hour and a half. Now, imagine if that was your entire life, right, and you're trying to make these choices. It's just – it's kind of an absurd proposition, but um, that's the sport for absurd propositions, right? We are talking about college football. All right, last question for Spencer Hall of SBNation.com. Uh, Steve Harvey apparently sent an email out to his staff where he said to them, basically, don't talk to me unless I talk to you, right? Don't talk to me from the makeup chair. Don't talk to me in the hallway. I need to take my personal life back. Like, what do yeah, we I'm have to do to, to do this ourselves? I'm trying to build. This is my favorite. People think this is outrageous. I'm like, these are great rules. I would totally post these for my kids, right? I'm trying to find more. I think one of the phrases, I'm trying to make more personal time, more space for me in the middle of the day. All right. So don't talk to me in the hallway. But I wanted to bring it up. If we were going to talk about college football. If there's a coach who reportedly has this as a rule that you do not look him in the eye when you go down the hallway. That'd be one Nick Saban. Really? So really? Really, this is Steve Harvey just cribbing from Nick Saban that, you know, don't don't look or talk to him in the hallway. Nick is very busy and his priority is football and you should not dissuade him from that. Uh, to be fair, I probably wouldn't say anything to Nick Saban in the hallway because I wouldn't see him. I'm six four. That's true. You're a very tall man, and as some people are fond of reminding others, uh Nick Saban is not. <laughs> Do you think he wears the lifts? Do you really think he wears lifts in his shoes? Um, you know, I would. What? I'm rich. I, I don't have to care what anyone thinks of me. That's fine. I'm getting 11 million a year. You give me the nicest, biggest lifts. If I were Nick Saban, I'd have like I'd have like the extenders. I'd have the like goldfish in the the aquarium in the shoe. Right? Why not? What are you going to say to me? You look ridiculous. You're like, cool. I make 11 million a year. <laughs> Spencer Hall, SBNation.com. Also check him out at EDSBS.com. Thanks so much, sir. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. All right, now, Chew Shell V-Power Nitro Plus Premium Gasoline for the best total engine protection you can get. The right time with Bomani Jones. 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. All right, Shannon, what we miss out on today? We know you can't be on top of all the news and information of the day. Now, if you haven't heard. All right, the San Antonio Spurs won a pivotal Game 5 over the Houston Rockets in overtime, and they did so without their best player, Kawhi Leonard. And moving forward, although Leonard says he's going to play in game six, there's a possibility he may or may not, meaning San Antonio would have to rely more on LaMarcus Aldridge. And if you haven't heard, here's Bomani Jones earlier today on The Right Time discussing the chances of San Antonio having to rely on LaMarcus Aldridge. And look, man, I told you this, and I felt bad about this before, but LaMarcus Aldridge's whole career, I had been holding one game against him, and it wasn't even a game that he played in the NBA. It was a game he played in college, the Elite Eight round against LSU in 2006, where Glenn Davis was guarding him, and he was guarding Glenn Davis. But Glenn Davis just basically was like, I'm going to move this dude off the block every time. He will not stop me from getting him off this block. And over and over again, you just saw LaMarcus Aldridge get moved off the block. And the thought at the time was, okay, well, LaMarcus Aldridge, when he gets his base stronger, because Glenn Davis at that point was probably about 320 pounds. So we're like, when he, when he gets his base stronger, these won't be problems, except it looks like he just doesn't have it in him. Like, he's not the guy that's going to try to back you down and create space on the block like that 
And I just can't figure out why that's the case now. The Rockets don't have a soul who I think can guard him. And I, I think Capella's good, but I don't think Capella can guard LaMarcus Aldridge. He should be able to do more, and he's just not. And so if they wind up out here in Game 6 without Kawhi Leonard, look, LaMarcus Aldridge, you're supposed to be that dude, right? When he was in Portland, you had the stories about him being a bit resentful of the fact that Damian Lillard was being treated as that dude, and Aldridge was not. Like, yo, this is your time to be that dude. You should be that dude. Do you just not have it in you to be that dude? Because it's here now. All right, if Kawhi does not lace him up for game six, does San Antonio have any shot to beat Houston at Houston? I mean, it's hard for me to imagine that they could because I just don't think, like, what would the Spurs be if they did not have Kawhi Leonard that season? Like, how good do you actually think they could be? So I feel like that this should be an, maybe not an easy win, but it should be a win for the Rockets. It's just about how hard is KG is CGB rather going to go at James Harden because he shut him down. Kawhi is the guy that you'd hope to be able to do it in the major moments, but it had to be Jonathan Simmons in this game, and it was. And speaking of which, we had a uh, right time Twitter poll today, which was tweeted out from the ESPN radio account, and our question was, are the Spurs a playoff team without Kawhi Leonard? 66% of the people said no. 34% of the people said yes. So that's that's not surprising because the majority of us would feel that they wouldn't make the playoffs without Kawhi, right? Especially in the West. I would think. I mean, I, we had some people that tried to fight us on this one, though, and I'm like, look, I feel you, but who else is going to get buckets? All right, we have a win-or-go-home situation tonight. We actually have two of those in the NHL, one of which we got Penguins and Capitals, which led to our other Twitter poll today. Would you want to attend a Game 7 that your team was playing in? Our choices, hell yes, or I'd rather watch at home. 65% of the people said that they would want to go watch their favorite team play in a game seven. Until they catch that L, then they catch that L, and they take that slow ride home. Yeah, how you feel about it then? Hey, you ain't think this all the way out, did you? Don't let that confidence walk you into heartbreak. Nothing about watching my team play in a Game 7 seems enjoyable. I'm sorry. Well, here's my thing. If it's important enough that I'd be willing to spend the bread to be able to go to the Game 7, then it's too important for me to be there. Does that make sense? Right? Like, if it's important enough for me to come up with that money, then I'll probably be too tense being there. And then be mad I spent the money if they lost. All right, with all the blowouts in this year's playoffs, one of the narratives, of course, was that uh, the playoffs have been kind of boring. Well, one of the things that hasn't been boring, of course, is Draymond Green and when Draymond Green has things to say. So, of course, now Draymond Green today talking about the media and how they're blowing everything out of proportion. I don't understand how all these things are always made so controversial. Not that it alters my daily life. Like, I still go home and have fun with my kids and have a great day. Um, but it's just ridiculous how everybody's always searching for a controversy. So there go y'all headline of the day. Draymond said Cleveland's playing great basketball. You Let's see it. if that one make it. Appreciate you, Draymond. Appreciate you. Like, I'm always here for things that we can talk about. And if you'll give it to us, I appreciate it. Because I totally get how frustrating it has to be for those dudes when we manufacture controversy. And I feel like on this show, at least when we talk about those sorts of things, we do try to be like, okay, come on, this isn't a big deal necessarily. But, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, you're right, Draymond. We absolutely make bigger deals out of these things than they are because all these hours ain't going to fill themselves. One thing that I hope, and of course I don't think it's going to happen, I just hope Draymond doesn't stop talking. No, 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 no. Like, I need this. I mean, he's absolutely right. We are using him for our own devices, right? We take what he says and we make more out of it so we can have something to talk about on these shows. Look, man, I made peace with that a long time ago because the solution to that is stop making stuff out of this and I got to go get me a real job. And I ain't going to get no real job just because Draymond's tired of it. But, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this every weekday, 4 p.m. Eastern. Shannon, Nuno, Steven, thanks so much. Jeff Dickerson's filling in for Jalen and Jacoby. He's coming up next. Thanks for listening to The Right Time Podcast. Please come back tomorrow for more. And don't forget to listen to The Right Time with Bomani Jones from 4 p.m. to 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app.